Scientists are searching for clues to what's been killing starfish. What is killing sea stars? In some places, 95% of the starfish population has died. It's called sea star wasting syndrome, and it causes the marine animals to die in a particularly gruesome way. And as the tissue dies, they oftentimes will lose arms and then waste away. We call it wasting away. They disintegrate. The arms just crawl away. We would really love the sign of hope that maybe they'll pull through, so we're going to be watching them very closely. I'm here in Point Reyes National Seashore with a team of researchers from the University of California Merced and we're out here to try and get a better understanding of this major mortality event in Pisastro Cratius, the ochre sea star, and to try and look at how the population's been affected during and now after this major disease outbreak. We're one of several teams working at the universities up and down the west coast of the U.S. investigating sea star wasting disease and we're trying to work out what the cause was, what the current situation is, and what that means for the future of the species. So in the last decade or so, we've observed a couple of different mass mortality events. A major mortality event of Pisaster associated with the 1997-98 El Nino event. Guama strongocentrotus perforatus, the purple urchin, probably associated with a harmful algal bloom. And now this Pisaster die-off, um, probably associated with sea star wasting disease caused by densovirus. These challenges that we're seeing in increasing frequency in the coastal environments are associated with climate change, sea surface temperature warming, increased amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, ocean acidification. And this combination of challenges is really putting stresses onto the organisms that live in the coastal environments. Even though the species was affected across its entire range from Mexico all the way up to Alaska, we do see variation in mortality across the sites. So that would suggest that maybe some pockets of individuals are affected differently than others. Some areas weren't affected at all, but at least across the section of coast that we've studied in depth from about central California up through Point Arena, we see 50 to 96% mortality in the populations. We have come here to Point Reyes National Seashore because this area was heavily affected by the mass mortality. And we want to collect some additional samples to do genomic studies. We can use um, genetics to look at signatures of the disease in the genome or also look at changes in the gene expression. Having had the opportunity to be out on the coast collecting samples the year before this major pandemic hit, really puts us in a unique position to be able to answer some of these questions that you couldn't otherwise answer only sampling after the fact. And so this gives us the opportunity to look at not only the genetic composition before this event, but to look at it during and after and also in the subsequent population, which will allow us to understand the ultimate impact of this disease on Pisaster and provide us with information to potentially reduce, mitigate, or prevent an event like this in the future. So if we consider this mortality event, we can kind of think of two extremes. And one would be in that all of the individuals that were susceptible died. And so what's left is the survivors that harbor some sort of resistance to the disease genetically. And if we think of the opposite end of the spectrum, we would expect no real differences genetically between the survivors and the, the part of the population that died. We have an assembled genome, information on the allele frequencies for the populations, and also a data set of transcriptomes. And we can use all this information together to look at areas of the genomes that can be directly affected by the disease. So we can identify if the gene is associated with immune response, a gene that is related to response to temperature change or a combination of the two interactions. Because it's a big cause and the difference in the 
alleles can also be exaggerated by local difference in the environment. The environment can be affecting a selective pressure on one population, while it's not that strong on other populations. We have observed some difference in the allele frequencies between the populations, so that might suggest that there are difference in how the genetics of the organism react to the mass mortality. The interesting bit is that although we saw this large decrease in the number of adult pisaster, at the same time we were seeing this really large increase, orders of magnitude, greater recruitment in the juveniles compared to the previous year. And so this has important consequences if we're thinking about the future of the species and that if these new recruits came from the survivors, then perhaps there's some sort of resistance to the disease then built into future generations. Whereas if those individuals came from that original population before the outbreak, then we would expect them to be a mix of susceptible, resistant, which may not protect them as much into the future. Our genetic data suggests that the recruits are similar to the populations before the mortality event. And we see a change similar to those of the surviving population. We need to better understand the event, study the characteristics, and can give us a clue on how species can persist and recover on the case of more mortality events. This time at least, it seems like Pisaster was lucky and that a large pulse of recruitment coincided with this major mortality event. And so the future seems somewhat hopeful as these new recruits start to integrate into the population. And so by plugging our results into this broader consortium who are working on sea star wasting disease from California through Oregon and into Washington, we have a real opportunity to try to understand what the causes were what the current status is and what the future holds for the species.